and I'm very happy to introduce Robert Rolle. He's an NTT security specialist. He, I think you've brought two very interesting case studies. Yes, if I'm rightly correct. There are some informed. case studies, yes. <laughs> Perfect. So he will talk on from data center centric to data centric. So um, organization wise, if you have any questions, there will be some minutes after the talk where you can post them, please. Thank you. Please start. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you might have seen down at our booth, our theme is Don't Gamble Your Security, and we are magicians, the magicians of the good power. And I want to take your opportunities out of your mind, use them in my mind, and put them out in a presentation right here. And that's what we're doing today. We're talking about all the fancy stuff. But furthermore, there are three key points that I want to talk about with you today. And that's my opinion. We are living in a world where it's going from data center centric to data centric. Because business models are shifting, there is not any data center with all your data, but it's moving. Like we, for example, using Salesforce as a CRM. So that's cloud business. Our data is not in our data center anymore, right? A second point that is, in my opinion, very important is, I think the need for consolidation and the reduction of complexity is really key to cope with security challenges. And the third point is to do that, the easiest way that you can do it is leverage security services. So let's get through that with some framing. You know about security in real life. So I have a Christmas story for you. Let's forward in time. If you grew up like me with a Christmas tree, there's a high chance that at one point in time you had a Christmas tea with a real candle or you had relatives or friends having that. And you know that can be dangerous, right? So at least some measures must be taken and actually I don't know anyone that has not taken these measures that want to risk their beloved ones with a fire, right? That's something that we do. Still, it is fact that 60% more house burnings are active in uh, December, so according to one Swiss insurance company. And fascinatingly, it takes like four seconds for a whole Christmas tree to burn down and just 36 seconds to burn the whole room down. That's something that we know from security, right? It's one glance that we are not looking and then the fire is going on. So to really have a view on that, on the left you see a Christmas tree that is watered. On the right you see a Christmas tree that is not watered. In both Christmas trees, oh that should not happen, on both Christmas trees you see there is some smoke, right? You see that on the left? Or, yeah, that's your left. That's a water tree because the one measurement that the NIST Institute took here is they watered the tree, nothing more. And on the other side, they have the same setup, but with a tree that was dry. It took only six seconds, and the fire is going from the tree to the room. And if you think about that, there are even more measures, easy ones, that you can take, like have a bucket of water next to you, right? Or don't leave the burning candles unattended. So there are a lot of things that we do in real life we should also do in cybersecurity. And what we also know is, maybe you don't dare to fight this fire. We call experts in if the real fire is going on, right? Everyone in Switzerland should memorize 118 and call the firefighters. Every expat like me, at least please remember 112, the European one. So there's a lot and there's experts. What I call services, <laughs> leverage services. And then you can learn from the mistake and think of even more services. What would be about the service of the good feeling of candles, but electricity candles? That are some security measures that you can take that are so easy, right? And that's the idea just from a perspective of physical safety. We can take that to the cybersecurity part. And why are we ignorant to cybersecurity? Well, I want to tell you my personal story on that. When I was a system engineer in an infrastructure company, security was for me a box, a box in a rack. It was like here, it was on top on something else, 
And why have I been so ignorant about it? Well, there was more infrastructure in the story for me to sell that was much more worth. So why care about security? That's a box and someone else is doing it. And I thought it's fine, right? I even thought I'm a good role model for my client because I'm telling them you need to have a backup, right? With media break. That's some kind of security, huh? protects you against ransomware. And I told them, please do patch management. Our software needs to be updated. And really, even like 10 years back, we still had or already had multi-factor authentication. So I felt like, well, security, I really did it very well. Dear customer, you're protected now. Well, they were not. <laughs> and I figured out that security is lovely by the time that I started to use a password manager. Because a password manager, that was interesting. It was not only saving my passwords, it was scanning the darknet and telling me when my accounts were compromised and on some list in the darknet. It told me if something was a double password or a bad one, or if just a service got compromised. So I thought, ah, oh, there are services for me that help me with security. So again, you're coming to my point, I leveraged security services, even for my private life. And that's when I figured out security might be a good business thing to be in. Now coming more to the client success stories <laughs> that you're waiting for, let's go to the market frame. So what is it what the market is seeing at the moment? So our friends from Gartner and KPMG, because we believe all these analyst companies, they are telling us a lot of things. I'm giving you my top three from both of them. So number one, there's an increasing board oversight or what they call digital trust. So what does it mean? Well, business is shifting. We told that, right? Everyone is using services from some place. So the data that's the worth of our business and of our business partners is somewhere around the globe and it's not protected in one data center. So someone has to take care of it. And we know, we see it, there's also regulation that's saying that. I mean, there's a new SEC rule for the um, New York Stock Exchange telling every company listed there, you have to disclose a security breach in four business days. So there's a lot of pressure going to the management board right now in terms of security. The second one is cybersecurity platform consolidation is a thing, and you can't do that without automation. So what does that mean? Well, just think about security. In our company, we divide security in like 60 subdomains. Can anyone have 60 vendors in their house or 60 partners doing 60 different things just for security? That's why consolidation is a key factor to cope with security challenges. And even then, automation is a key because the attackers are using a lot of automation. They are quick, so we can't be the ones using only the human factor. And the third one, threat exposure management, um, or what comes to my title, securing a perimeterless and data-centric world. Yes, there's not no perimeter, but data is everywhere. And that comes also from the business model that are shifting, and we are using SaaS services. So let's go to the real client examples that you are waiting for. Disclaimer here, I'm using an example in first instance of a company that is not a client of ours and I'm only using information that is publicly available. So you can research everything of that. A company called Evotech got hacked. Evotech is a biotech company in Germany and they are listed in Frankfurt Stock Exchange and in New York. They have like 5,000 people around the globe and a multi-million business. And data is really important for them. I mean, they're doing this fancy stuff that I don't understand. They, they're folding some proteins and so on. It's really biological science. And they're sharing a lot of data with their business partner. So that's really reflecting these business data running around model. And they had the bad news, that's their ad hoc news at their homepage, they got hacked. And I want to highlight how KPMG and Gartner are right. So it was the CEO that took an uncommonly active public role in this incident and communicated. 
to the public, but also internally. And it was him that said, it's convinced him that his business partners are still found trust in them because he was open. He said, yes, the house is burning. We are open about it, but we are on it. So I will talk to you to regain trust. And still that means all the bad things for this client happened. So they were not able to pay the bills. They were not able to pay the salaries. They were not able to fill the documents required every year from the stock exchange and they got delisted at Frankfurt Stock Exchange. They were not even able to call their clients because the contact book is online. So they didn't have the phone numbers. So that convinced me that these increasing board oversight, this example says that yes, the C level is taking care and digital trust is something that he really believes in, so that's a good example. Next example in the story is it was the CEO who knew what ransomware can do, well done, and that it's a risk for their business partners. So he decided to lock down, which is on the next slide. It was a 20 second discussion to shut down all the systems during the incidents. That was not in the IT department, what, that was the C-level board deciding it. So that proves to me they are really aware about the threat exposure in terms of business data here and able to take decisions on their IT security level. And last part of this story is the CEO who shares biological data to do some common science says, well, if we would share threat intelligence, it would be earlier in the cycle that we find errors. I said, that's a good thinking. Thinking forward, that's what vendors and us are doing. Like as a tier one provider, we are collecting threat intelligence from all over the globe and using that and sharing with clients. So that's the right direction, dear CEO of Biotech. Yeah. So cybersecurity platform consolidation, what I said, and the trust and automation, they understood it. So for me, KPNG and Gartner did a good job here. The predictions are correct. Let's now come to the story of our client. And we figured out what a public client did, so what they did after the hack. But how did it come to the security incident? And what can be done then? That's the open question here. And I'm going from um, to one of our clients, diving deep. However, it will be anonymous. They don't want to be mentioned. So that's something that most of you probably have seen. If not, that's the timeline of a security breach. And it's starting here on 22nd of June with an impersonation email. The email was perfectly fine. It was the right content from the right people, but copied over from some bad actors and sent from a bad domain. And they exchanged the payload which was before some really legit payload. Now it was a zip file. And the zip file did not include it, the files that were originally in, but links that downloaded Qubit. So bad for them. The whole story went on. The attackers had a look. And then you see it took two days 22nd of June to 24th of June until the privilege escalation happened in the network. One can only guess if there was an access broker and then handing over to the client who did the rest of the hack. I don't know. Our DFIR team doesn't know. But it says there is some time from the initial email to the catastrophe where reaction could be happened. But it didn't because they had no EDR. They had no managed SOC at this point. So now let's go into the life of our team. So our team was driving to a convention, actually a convention like that one. And they've been in the car and the boss of our DFR team got a call. And the call was very unpleasant as well. The client saying, we got hacked. Actually, there's a ransomware and they want some X, Y, Z millions from us. I'm not willing to pay that. I'm willing to invest that money in you so that you save us and leave us afterwards better than we've been before. So what happens then? Well, we have a Ghostbusters truck. Who are you gonna call Ghostbusters? You got hacked, who are you gonna call NTT? 
So that's our track, and it's preloaded with everything that a Ghostbuster or a DIR expert needs. So there's some storage already in there. There is um, a lot of servers in there with hypervisors on, so we can immediately dump the memories and do the EDFIR work, while we can also run backup back to servers and set up a second infrastructure while we are analyzing the attack. So that's time up and running is very short. So these guys came over and then they took over the responsibility. So that's what we call the heavy lifting. Actually, there is some heavy lifting, getting the rack out of the van. That's another part, but what I'm talking about the most heavy lifting is communication, actually. Because imagine a client in this situation. They are stressed. They are completely stressed out. So best thing that you can have is someone from external taking over all communication. So that's what we call crisis management. And we do this. We're taking over crisis management, deciding with the board to whom we communicate, in which order, and we guide them through everything that's necessary because there are legal boundaries about it. There's also another part that we do. It's immediately DFIR agents coming in, dumping the memory and doing analysis because we want to know what happened, right? That's necessary to, to find the leak in the systems. Another point that's immediately taken, well, we take over the control over the workforce of the client. One of the things that's totally underestimated is that a stressed out employee is not working efficiently. So our crisis management, first thing they do is go home, have a sleep. Go home, have a sleep, come back tomorrow. We want you refreshed. Our guys are taking over. And everyone is only doing one shift. There are no 24-7 shifts in this crisis management. So that's one of the things that we are enforcing, and it's helping the client. Another thing, like I said, putting up the second infrastructure just to get everyone ready. And then, yes, recovery from backup. That's the best thing on a second infrastructure that's completely clean, built up from us on clean hardware. We restore backups and try to get the cl client back and running. So that's during the crisis. After that is done and the infrastructure is running, our DFIR team was successful. They found the leak. They closed it. They do still some work in the background because they want to find out who was it, what was it kind of actor, do we know the tactics, can we trace it back to some other country. That's not really interesting for the client, just for us. But after that, there's another thing. What can you learn from that for the future? So what we do afterward is lessons learned. And that, that is a chess game. A chess game is a table board game, and that's what we're actually doing. We do a tabletop. It's a tabletop exercise. It's called a game. It's not that money, much fun for the client itself. What we're doing is we have the lead DIR agents from the case, and they will recreate a scenario where the client can learn from it. So how will the technicians act in case of an incident? Um, who is informed and when? And restore that from what happened originally. Yes. Who do we communicate to? What do we do first? Is there anything that we must do? Is there anything that we have forgotten before? Like the company before that had only online phone books? They don't even have the phone number of the IT support in written form on paper. So something like that will be, pl will be played down. Crisis playbooks. That's what we all do. They even go further and doing some calls like in the middle they put some stress in the game and the client will get a call from the gangster, and the call will say, hey, we saw that you're trying to do your backup, we deleted it. Or they call a business partner, and the business partner's calling, hey, you got hacked, and your hacker called us, and they, they say they will expose our data. So that's what we all do also on top of it, so that the client afterwards will come out in a situation way better suited than before. The moral of the story, what do companies spend on in terms of security? Don't read it, don't read it, I know that's a lot of numbers. They invest in firewalls, VPN, and application security. The case study that we've seen, what was it about? About firewalls and VPNs? No. Application security might argue, but there is always something coming through the gates. No one is invulnerable, no one. So the reaction was not quick enough. 
a managed SOC service would have been a helpful client. So let's see for the IT overall spendings. Is VPN firewalls a wise use? Well, we see in overall IT that the spend is shifting to the dark blue bubble. The light blue is on the bottom, dark blue on the top. Dark blue says IT services. So to cope with the complexity of our reality, people are using IT services. And that's a much wiser spending. And that leaves me with my three points from the beginning. We are living in a world that is data-centric. Data center-centric is the past, the data is the future, it's our business data, it's the importance and the value of our business, and it's everywhere. The second part is there's a lot of complexity and we need to reduce complexity and consolidate where possible these 60 well-known subdomains or 800 global cybersecurity companies. It's doing so much stuff, no client can handle that alone. And the last one, as I said, leverage services. So the message that I would give to you is leveraging services is your key way to consolidate and reduce complexity in a world where you have to cope with a situation that data is everywhere and it's the most precious thing that you can protect. My name is Robert, I'm from NTT and our mission is to secure our connected future. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Robert. Thank you very much. We were perfect in time. Thank you. Um, so please, if you have any questions, um, you're welcome to ask. No, or maybe I can break the ice. I have. Oh. You have one. No, yeah. one start, please. <laughs> Uh, about the first company that he showed, is yep. there? How did it work out for them? Like, did they manage to retra retain the trust with their partners? Yes, they actually. I mean, it's not a client of us, but it's all publicly available. Yes, actually, it was good. They managed to regain the trust because of the open communication that they had, and they had some experts in house building up and doing the heavy lifting for them. So that that's how they came back. However, it took a while. I think we would have been quicker. <laughs> yes. Well, do you know if Evertech already had people in place before that happened, or they just oh we have a problem situation now we have to get some new people ah. now fly them in? We don't know which company we just hire one. Yes. So um, no, I, I can't comment on that one. I, I'm, I'm sorry, right? just because I heard something and it's not publicly available, I can't comment on that one. But they had an IT provider before. That's what I can tell you. Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, when you work together with a company, do you um, or to establish preventive measures for a crisis situation? Do you work together with like existing crisis teams, mm -hmm. or from from a physical side, for example? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, f fire situations or whatever. Sometimes yeah. they have already crisis mm. situations yeah. of a different kind. And, and, and it's better. actually better documented than in mm. many cybersecurity parts because mm. physical safety, there is much more regulation. But it's a totally different story, actually. Yeah. Th there are different people. But it would be worth taking over some of the experience from the physical safety guys. You know, maybe use, reuse some channels if they're useful mm. for the... Yes. Like communication channels, I don't know, reaching out into the company or something. Y yes, well, they also rely, partially depends on the company, mm -hmm. on the internal IT, what I said, no, that's not smart. <laughs> Have it on paper. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's a question back there. Uh, you mentioned that you, you built um, a parallel infrastructure and then the focus was on lessons learned. So this was a very small part, but yes. what's the, what is the experience from your side to build this parallel uninfected new infrastructure? And do you do it in the truck or in two trucks? No, no, the, the, truck, yeah, the truck will be deloaded to the customer side and then we have to work together with the internal IT to find out which are the most precious servers. I mean, you want to have a new Active Directory and so on and do that one by one. And it really depends then on the client and the client use case. Mm -hmm. So it always starts with not 
always, but with some kind of identity management, like an Active Directory, and then it goes from what is needed for them. That's very different. Um, mm -hmm. Do you also have use cases where you start with the um, with the instant response? You said instant response is a parallel process. Do you also have cases where you say you first want to focus on the patient zero and then try to um, yeah, delete all the malware artifacts and assume that you have found all entries and can start there? So if we had that, well, it was serial, you said? Um, Basically, I just know one, one, after the one competitor other? says um, the insurance companies yeah. prefer if you would first hunt for the, yeah. for the threat actor, yeah. where did he get in, can you delete the remote access, yeah. can you delete any access he has, are yeah. you confident in this, and then rebuild um, or just put in the restore backup yeah. processes yes. to save time for the infrastructure. Yeah, for, for um, the fast, the most liked way is to do it parallel. So having the DFIR team there and the infrastructure team in parallel. And so the restore of backup is on these other infrastructure. Even if there would be something on the backup, it's not reflecting on the main network because that's need to be down for the DFIR team, right? But if a client for any reason needs to be this one first and then the other, of course, that's possible. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And the last question would be, do you have experience or recommendations on um, backup infrastructures? Because there's differences of having a, a backup that you can restore and a backup that you can search for malware and the backup yes. that you maybe can clean up before you restore it and maybe thereby save time instead of doing try and error. Let's try the last one. Oh, it's infected. Okay, let's restore again. Yes. Uh, third last version. What is the experience from the customers and, and, yeah. and timing? Yeah, that's a lovely question. So I'm coming from a storage company before, <laughs> and backup was one of our things. So I don't want to make commercials over here. It, it really depends. It really depends. So what is the budget that you have? What is the need for your restore time? Sometimes a tape library is good enough and it's a media break. Sometimes restore for any reason needs to be so quick that you need disk based backup. I can't say it's in general that one. It really depends on the case, but it's a discussion that we can have. Please feel welcome to come down to our booth. Any more questions? I have another question. Yes, yes. How, um, when you go to the lessons learned with your client, yeah. can you involve all parts of a company, obviously the CEO level, yeah. the communication level, uh, maybe human resources, if there's an issue yeah. there or people were affected by all of this. If so, um, yes. so do you get the company actually to also rethink their internal structure yeah. in a crisis? Because yeah. I heard very often they say, okay, IT crisis, IT team, and yeah. they don't involve all the other levels which are actually yeah. affected. Yeah, no, no, for us, I mean, in, for this client, it was even the C-level that called us. Mm -hmm. So the board was the first one to take this exercise. They did the first, the hard stuff first. Mm -hmm. And it was on all level, levels necessary. So all the technicians, mm -hmm. all the middle management was involved. And it really depends on the client. If HR is involved, maybe the league was within this department. Yes, mm -hmm. then they will be involved. It really depends where did it go wrong. Yeah. We just have to find out where did it went wrong, what measures were missing, and then train them on not doing it again and guiding them to the way how to do it now. Yeah. Please, do you have any more questions? If not, maybe they come up later, and yes. I'm sure you're still there for the upper room? Sure, yes. Okay. Feel free to ask me, yes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great day and see you later. Yeah. And for everyone, this was the last session, as I said, in this room. Please, for the closing keynote of, uh, of Vanya uh, Viskovic, please go to the arena. I'm sure it will be very interesting. And then you can enjoy after a very hard day of work and listening the apparel. Thank you.